Good morning. morning. Grace and peace for our Lord Jesus Christ be with each of you this morning. It's great to see you here. What a beautiful morning. Um, And it's great to have Julie Combs back with us. Yeah. Can't keep this. Can't keep the good ones down. You're a walking miracle. Thanks. It's great to see you. Um, Also, any other guests or visitors here? Um, be sure and fill out your, your connect card. It's right there in front of you in the pews. You just throw that in the offering plate. And I had to do this last week, and I just slipped my mind. I don't know if we had so much going on in the service last week, but I wanted to mention how much I really appreciate, and on behalf of Charles and Jimmy as well, how much we appreciate all the cards and gift cards and kind words and everything we received during Pastor Appreciation Month. I know for Brenda and I, we certainly feel loved and appreciated, and there's nowhere else on this planet we'd rather be than right here serving alongside our, our new McHenry family. So, so thank you, and on behalf of Charles and Jimmy, thank you as well for all those, those kind things. Thanks. Also, I guess yesterday was Veterans Day, so just a, a quick survey here. How many Army guys we got in here? Army vets. Raise your hand. There you go. How about, uh, let's see, Army, Navy? How many Navy guys we got? Got a few Navy guys? Air Force? (laughs) Anybody Army Air Corps? Probably not old enough to be, too old for that. Uh, Army, uh, Marines? There we go. Marine Aviator. Uh, Coast Guard? No Coast Guard? No Puddle Pirates, huh? Huh. Okay. All right. The other, so thanks for all those who served. And, and the other thing that I always want to remember on, on Veterans Day, and I think it's just every bit as important as honoring our, our vets, and that is our first responders. You know, I think that the cool thing and the reason we, we look at our, our vets in a certain way and, and honor them is because they're the ones that when the fight's going down, they run toward it when other people run away from it. And it's the same for our police. You know, our police, when it's going down, you know, we're having the worst day of our life, who do you call? You call 911 and the police show up. Um, When a building's on fire, most of us leave the building. Firemen go into the building um, and our our medics. So I think it's also important for us to recognize those folks on Veterans Day as well. I wish they'd change the name of it to include those folks, but our first responders and and just like our military, who's guarding the wall somewhere, we also have our, our police and fire and our, our medics that are patrolling the streets right now, uh, keeping us safe. So I think it's important to honor them as well. Uh, we also have a bulletin insert in here with one side. has got our men's retreat, and our men's retreat this year is under new management. It's going to be a little different than it was in the past, but it's going to be good. It's on uh, roughly the same weekend as it is every year, so you can, there's a QR code thing you can scan there and, and get more information on it, but it's uh, time to start signing up for our men's retreat. And on the other side is our Hope for Christmas, and it also has a QR code with some instructions, but it's, it's got the items that, that we need, and that's an ongoing partnership with our, with our school district. And the last thing that I need to mention, two more things real quick, is our, our kids' Christmas program. So we are going to have a kids' Christmas program. You can read about it in the, in the bulletin. But practices start start next Sunday, so um, Pace wanted me to mention that. And last but not least, um, if you didn't get a chance to turn in your estimate of giving card, um, you can do so, run it by the office, or you can put it in the offering plate today or next Sunday. Um, but we want to get that done so that we can get on with our with our budgeting process. Okay. And now, with all that said, I feel like it's a lot of announcements. I want to have Todd, our lay leader, talk about our feed my starving children. Well, good morning. So how many of you ever heard of Feed My Starving Children? All right. How many of you have ever participated in a Feed My Starving Children event? Most of you, of course. We've been doing this for several years now. and um, I, I'm sure you all agree that when you come out of that event, you can't feel, you have to feel good about what you've accomplished in feeding kids around the world. Over the past several years, New McKendry has stepped up to lead our community 
in the uh, Jackson Feed My Starving Children Mobile Food Pack. Back in March, we joined with 17 other churches and partner organizations to pack 233,871 meals. By doing so, we ensured that 640 kids have an opportunity to eat a meal a day for a year. So on March 8th and 9th of 2024, we will once again be hosting the Jackson Community Food Pack event at the Jackson Civic Center. We are currently reaching out to other churches and organizations to find out who wants to join us this year. We had 17 last year. I'm quite confident we'll have more than that this year. Uh, we continue to have interest from other organizations and churches in, in the area. Uh, once again, we will also be having our eighth graders from the Jackson Junior High joining us. They'll be packing on Friday the 8th. This is the third year that the students have joined us in the goal of serving and feeding others. And our Jackson schools are committed to graduating givers and not takers. And these events are truly an example of our community coming together and giving these, these kids an opportunity to serve and learn what it's like to serve because many of them maybe don't get those chances at home. So as you know, hosting this type of, of an event comes at a significant financial cost. This year, New McKendry, like in the last eight years, uh, is committing to making sure that this event happens, which means we're gonna fund the first 100,000 meals. That comes at a cost of $29,000. And because of your generosity, we've already got $10,500 in hand for that purpose. This year's Thanksgiving offering will go towards this purpose. Friends, I know this is a big number, but it's always been a big number. And we've always done it somehow, some way. And I have no doubt this year will be no different. At New McKendry, our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. The world of a child cannot be transformed if they go hungry. As many of you know, New McHenry has a relationship with a community in Bois Jute, Haiti, where we support a church and a community, and we have sent people down there for years to help make disciples. Of course, right now, the political climate down there doesn't make it possible for us to go. But we still support that area. And on those trips, how many of you have been to Haiti? I know I'm looking around the room. There's several, several up here. Um, the pictures behind me, Steve Burke took when he was in Haiti. Uh, we've had an opportunity when, when our team goes down there to prepare and serve these meals to those kids. And we've seen firsthand what, what they do. You see, those, those kids show up at that orphanage with a spoon in their hand, maybe the only possession they have to get their one meal a day. And to them, one meal a day is fully fed. One bowl of this is all they get. And it's because people like you step up and make this happen. So you know, we're, we're trying to finish up our Move Capital campaign, and, and we did that capital campaign so that we could do ministry now and for generations to come. Friends, Feed My Starving Children is one of those ministries that we want to continue. So while we're all sitting around the table on Thanksgiving Day eating far more food than we ever should, there will be many around the world who don't have anything to eat. And it's our job to put some food on their table. I am confident that we'll meet our goal and God will use our hands and our feet to make disciples in our community, our nation, in our world. And I'm proud to serve along our new McKendry family and all of you in responding to God's call. So thank you and God bless. Thanks, Doug. Thank you for your leadership. Now if you please stand for our, our choral intro and followed by our opening prayer.
Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this beautiful morning. Thank you for this beautiful place, these beautiful people. We thank you for the opportunity to come into your house by your invitation to worship you. And Lord, as we've gathered for worship, help us to be completely present in this place and this time. Help us to pour out everything that we have into worship this morning. Or we don't come to receive, we come to, to give, to give, to give our worship to you. But Lord, we also know that as we pour ourselves out in worship, you will fill us up. You will fill us up and you will send us out to share what we received here, the blessing we received here with someone on the other side of those doors. Lord, thank you for inviting us. And thank you for sending us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, please remain standing for our opening hymn of praise, which is over a thousand tongues to sing. We'll sing the first three verses and the last verse. kid and actually kind of still is a little hard for me being humble I would just like eight-year-old me I would just prance around when I did something good in school or when I cleaned my room without somebody asking or even if I put on a cute outfit and I just knew it was adorable I was just walking around just waiting for someone to say oh Sarah you're so wonderful. This is so wonderful. You're just the best. And I would just wait for him to say that. How do you think God felt about me and being humble? I'm going to let you think about that. Because the scripture is going to talk about that today. And you're going to hear a story, and there are two guys that come to church and pray. And one of them is called a Pharisee, which is like a big deal in the church. And he prays like, oh, really loudly so everyone can hear. Oh, God, hear all the things that I've done that are wonderful and all the money that I've given that's wonderful. And I'm just the best for you, God. Does that sound familiar? So then there's this other guy, and he is a tax collector and he is described as despised like that that is a strong word do you know what despised means hated just not likable doesn't do the right thing nothing so he prays silently in a corner hoping no one sees him and his prayer is a very humble prayer He's basically like, God, I'm a sinner, and I'm, and I'm sorry. And if you can take any, if you can forgive me, please forgive me. And do you know which one of those is more pleasing to God? The 
sinner. Yeah, the, the despised one. And Jesus tells the story about these guys because Jesus wants us to be humble. Because, spoiler alert, everybody's a sinner. Right? Yes, yes. And eight-year-old Sarah, yeah, I probably did some great things, but I also did some wrong things, too. And it's really, really important for us to remember that we've got to stay humble. Because then, if we're staying humble, then the things that we do are not about getting that attention, somebody saying, oh, you're so wonderful. Then the things that we do are about God, right? And pleasing God. So, can you guys pray with me? Repeat that for me. Dear God, Thank you, Thank you for your forgiveness. For your forgiveness. Help, us Help us be humble, be humble and, pleasing and pleasing to God. To God. In, Jesus name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So here's the thing. Sometimes when people talk about um, being humble, they talk about eating something called humble pie. But that doesn't actually sound as delicious as chocolate, so I brought chocolate. <laughs> so take two pieces and go be humble and do good things for God. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of God. For the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, Matt. You never know what's going to turn up on fire. Well, this is uh, one of the scripture, one of my favorite parables in all, in all the Gospels. And one thing I want to bring up is, is have you ever noticed that throughout the Bible, the hero um, always ends up being the one that you least expect? Anybody ever notice that? You know, you pick a story, any story between Genesis and Revelation, the chances are good that you'll find God employing characters in a way they're just completely contrary to kind of our normal, predictable, um, conventional way of, of human thinking. And it's throughout Scripture. For example, who'd God choose to be his chosen people? It certainly wasn't the, the purebred, mighty Egyptians. You know, God chose this mixed bag conglomeration of, of slaves. And he made them the nation of Israel. And when God's chosen people, the nation of Israel, decided they wanted, they wanted their own king so they could be like all the other nations, God reluctantly let them have their way and let, him, let them choose their own king. And who'd they choose? Well, they chose mighty King Saul. How'd that turn out? It was kind of a train wreck. Mighty King Saul, the one that they had chosen, for themselves, he turned out to be a, you know, a paranoid nutcase. So who God choose to replace King Saul? Well, God took the wheel, and, and he chose a poor shepherd boy named David. And as history shows, God's choice worked out a, a whole lot better. Or how about Jesus' good Samaritan parable? Who came to the aid of that Jewish traveler in need? It certainly wasn't the godly Jewish priest, and it certainly wasn't the godly temple assistant. It was, of all people, the Jew's arch enemy was a mangy old Samaritan. See, when it comes to these unlikely heroes, I think the best example of them all, of course, is, is Jesus himself. You know, the Jews were expecting God to crown for them a Messiah king, a Messiah king who would forever reign on that mighty throne of, of his chosen people's kingdom. But who God sent? God sent him a Messiah king, all right, but the Messiah king's throne was a wooden Roman cross, and his crown was made of thorns. Then we come to today's scripture lesson, today's um, parable from Luke. And of all people, it's the tax collector that God chooses to model for us what humility in prayer looks like. A tax collector, a man that's a, a criminal and a traitor to his people. That's who God chose to be the hero. You know, in today's world, a tax collector is a federal government employee who works for the Internal Revenue Service. Um, they get a bad rap because none of us like to pay taxes. I don't know of anybody who enjoys paying taxes. But I would hardly, hardly call a modern-day tax collector, I would hardly call him a criminal. But when Jesus was telling this story, that wasn't the case. Tax collectors were well-paid criminals. They were, they were extortioners. They were traitors. They were Jews who were contracted by the Roman government to bleed as much money as they possibly could out of their own people. So why would Jesus choose a professional extortionist to model how we should pray? Why would he choose a treasonous stooge, a treasonous stooge of the oppressive Roman Empire to be the poster child for holiness? Why would he choose a tax collector a dishonest tax collector to represent what honesty in prayer looks like. You know, if you were put in charge, if you or I were put in charge um, of coming up with the perfect hero for this parable, if God had tapped us on the shoulder and not his son to come up with this parable, um, who might we have chosen? Maybe Mother Teresa, St. Francis of Assisi, Billy Graham, one of the Wesley brothers. They'd all be good choices, and we should all aspire to have resumes like theirs, but evidently, they're not the type that God would choose. Once again, God goes with the candidates we would consider to be the least qualified, and God makes them the most qualified representative of humility, 
and righteousness and holiness. So why did Jesus, back to the original question, why would Jesus use this unlikely story and this unlikely hero? You know, perhaps Jesus used this style of storytelling because it left absolutely no room for human boasting. No room for human boasting. Maybe he used it, this unlikely hero, because of the way it maximizes our creator and minimizes us creatures. You see, I think, I think Jesus wanted the light of this tax collector's prayer to stand out against the blackness of his tax collecting character. Because that's how God makes God-sized moves in the hearts of his creatures. From the worst sinner to the most saintly, none fall outside of the scope of God's love. And this parable illustrates the limitless bounds of God's love for, for all creation. It proves that God seeks all those whose hearts are broken by their sin. Well, let's take a closer look and look a bit deeper at this unlikely tax collector. You know, through the words of that, of the Pharisees, self-gratifying prayer, um, we're given kind of a first-hand view into the tax collector's reputation, and a first-hand view into the tax collector's standing within his community. First thing we notice is evidenced by the fact that this tax collector went to the temple to pray. He's obviously a Jew. And as for the life he must have led, you know, the Pharisee ranks him down there with the thieves and the adulterers and the like. Not to defend the self-righteous Pharisee, but he was probably right about that. But with some imagination and a little bit of conjecture on our parts, let's see if we can maybe draw a few more conclusions regarding this unlikely hero. You know, maybe our, our tax collector, our tax collector turned hero, maybe he was brought up as a pious, faithful Jew in a loving Jewish family. And maybe in his rebellious teen years, he ran away from his parents and he ran away from their values. Maybe separated from the love and the guiding hand of his parents, maybe he couldn't find any other occupation that suited his restless appetite. So left with no moral compass for his life, he gravitated to the corrupt class of folks that collected Roman taxes. And who knows to what extent our hero had employed extortion to co coerce widows and orphans out of their, the last of their meager subsistence. You see, in those days, Roman, the Roman government, they granted tax collectors almost unlimited power. All means necessary were at the tax collector's disposal. So left with no apparent accountability, for his actions, there's no way of knowing how far this lost soul went to leverage his power against his own people. So what led this poorest of souls to the temple that day? This must have been a, a pretty rare occurrence in that day and age because tax collectors, for obvious reasons, they didn't hang around in the temple too much. In fact, it would have been an, seen as an abomination for a tax collector to defile the temple with his presence. But before we get too far into our conjecture, let's not discount the hand of our creator and his constant presence working within his creation. So is it too far-fetched to think that the spirit of God had somewhere along the way met with our hero? Is it too far-fetched to think that the heavy hand of our loving God caused our hero to evaluate the blackness of his, of his existence. Could it be that the Holy Spirit led the tax collector hero to confront the hypocrisy of his way? Just imagine this, this troubled soul. Maybe for days he carried this burden around. And he was, he was unable to carry out his duties during the day, and it, and it must have been torture at night as he lay there alone with his own thoughts. And finally... Unable to bear the, mis the misery any longer, he thought of the house of God and the sacrifices offered there daily. He thought, to whom or where should I go but to God? Where else can I hope to find mercy? What were sacrifices offered? 
So with unsure feet, he climbs the steps to the sanctuary, but he's too ashamed to enter. And unlike the Pharisee in our parable, who stands, he's, who stands there with his eyes looking up, his arms up, our hero stands in the doorway, far off in the corner, alone with his guilt and shame. The tax collector is rattling off his own resume. But the, the Pharisee is rattling off his own resume, but the tax collector, he just hangs his head in shame. And as he's hanging his head in shame, something happens. Conveyed on the utterance of a few simple, heartfelt words, he lays his sacrifice at the feet of his loving father. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That was his sacrifice. And with it, something, something miraculous happens. This poor soul's prayer is heard. This humble sacrifice is received, and the angel, I can picture the angels in, in heaven rejoicing as his pardon is registered. And as our hero's many sins are instantly washed away and forgotten forever, the child is suddenly reconciled with the father. And can't you imagine the celebration in heaven? Can't you imagine the smile on God's face because one of his children was lost but now is found? Is dead but now is alive again. It's really a great story. But it only matters if we, if we figure out where we fit into this story. How does this story fit into our 21st century lives? With that in mind, let me ask you, what's your prayer life like? What's your prayer life like? Now, granted, the Pharisee's egotistical prayer is, is rather extreme, but it does point to something I think we all need to consider. In those intimate conversations between you and God, do you focus more on your own desire? Do you focus more on yourself? Or do you focus more on God and what God desires? You know, the prayer prayed by that Pharisee conveyed loud and clear that, that pride and prayer are mutually exclusive. You can't be proud and pray at the same time. Pride and prayer are incompatible. And the Pharisee's contribution to this parable it pretty much proves that. It proves that the gates of heaven are so low that in order to enter, you've got to be on your knees. And your head's got to be hanging tax collector low. And I think another thing this parable teaches is that you can't elevate yourself to God by putting down another one of God's loved children. Our prayer, should, our prayer should be about lifting, lifting ourselves above someone else. The starting point for prayer is remembering that, that we're one of a great army of sinning and suffering humanity. And we're all kneeling before the throne of God's mercy. So the question is not whether I'm as good as the other guy. The other guy isn't the standard. God doesn't want us to compete for his loving acceptance. The well of God's loving mercy is limitless, and there's room for all of God's children under the blanket of his grace. And the last thought I have regarding our own prayer life, whether it's our individual prayer life or our collective prayer life, and as it applies to our situation in this day and age. And I've thought about how to, how to put this or pose this, but couldn't come up with a good way, so I'll put it this way. I think it's pretty safe to assume that most of us, you know, worry about what's happening in our nation and worry about what's going on in the world today. I think it's pretty safe that most of us, one way or the other, we, we're concerned about our, the state of our nation's leadership and perhaps our world's leadership. I think it's also pretty safe to assume that, that many of us worry about the direction of this denomination, the United Methodist Church. And if we're honest with ourselves, we're, we're probably a little worried that, that we're in the midst of this uh, kind of a, a epidemic of moral decay, 
going on in this culture today. And besides worrying about worrying about all of it and, and shaking our heads, what do us Christians do about it? Obviously, we pray. It's a good starting point, of course, but, but how do we pray for our nation? How do we pray for all these concerns? And the thought I had was this. You know, it's awful easy for us to fall into the Pharisee trap when we lift those concerns to God. In the midst of all that we see around us that's ungodly, it's awful easy for us to spend our time in prayer reminding God that we're not like those other folks. That we're the righteous ones. But here's the thing. God sent his son to save the unrighteous, not the righteous. And we're all unrighteous. Compared to God, we are all tax collectors. We're playing ourselves off as, uh, as Pharisees. That ain't the way to go. Our prayer has to start with, God have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. That's the starting point of our prayer. And the punchline of this scripture and the ending point of our prayer is, is God's response to us. All who exalt themselves will be humbled. But all who humble themselves will be exalted. Amen? Amen. Amen. Response to God's word, let's stand and sing Rock of Ages, number 361. Be seated. So, on the back of your bulletin, we have our, our prayer list, and I pray that uh, pray that you pray over these, uh, and make these a part of your your daily prayer life. These are our family members, and uh, kind of job number one for us, the, the greatest chore that we have is to is to pray for one another. Pray for one another and serve one another. And this is this is how we keep track of this on the back of the bulletin. And speaking of that, if there's names we need to update on this or folks we can take off the list, be sure and put that on a on a card and stick it in the offering plate so that we can always keep this up to date. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Father God, we lift before you the names of, of the people on our, on our prayer list. We know that there are many other prayer concerns that each of us have that, are, that aren't spoken and certainly aren't written here. But Lord, you know the name of, of each one of those. And even, when Lord, when we can't pray, um, you know the, the utterances of our hearts. So Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for always answering when we call. Thank you for being forever present in our lives. Lord, there's so much going on in this world, and we, we often feel helpless as to what we can do, whether it's, the, whether it's what's going on in, in Israel and Palestine or natural disasters or just violence, people perpetuating violence against other people. Lord, there's so much darkness in this world. Lord, help us to be the, the people that reflect your light and your love. When there's an opportunity, Lord, for us to serve, may we serve, not by our own strength, but by yours. When there's an opportunity for us to, to give, Lord, help us to give. Lord, when there's an opportunity for us to shine your light and your love, help us to be more concerned about the other than they are ourselves. Your loving sacrifice shines through us. Lord, I thank you for this church family. I thank you for the, the ministry that you put before us. I thank you for the challenges that makes us, reminds us of how much we rely on you. And we thank you for the joy of, of being a family, a family of Christ. Lord, thank you for hearing our prayer as we continue with one voice. Pray the prayer your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 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 Now, if the ushers will come forward, let's prepare to give back to God some of our first and our best with our gifts, tithes, and offerings.
Father God, you are the giver of every good gift. Please accept this, this small gift that we can offer. You put it in your hands so that you can multiply it and magnify it and turn this into life for someone else. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, before we uh, sing our closing hymn, I do have a, found a note here that I should have read before. I do have a, one concern. Patty Mavers, her mother passed away, um, I think it was Friday, or was it Saturday? Um, Saturday at 1. Okay. So, uh, Wilma Copeland is, is the name, and the services are going to be on Tuesday, visitations from 10 to 12, at Ford and Sons at Cape, and then the service will be at, at noon. So, Patty, you're in, you're in our, I can't see you back, there you are, there you are, you're in our, in our prayers. That's the concern, the joy is, it's, again, it's good to have Julie back with us, right there in your pew, nobody has sat there the whole time you've been gone, we've been saving it for you. Uh, let me off. Let's uh, let's join in our, our closing hymn, which is Seek Ye First, number 405. After we leave this place, we go knowing that we're never alone. We've got our, the good shepherd goes before us to guide our steps. Our loving father stands behind us. And most of all, our savior walks with us. And we're forever underneath the blanket of his grace as we leave this place to love and serve and be a reflection of his light and love in that world out there. Go in peace. Amen? Amen. Amen.